Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition here focused on our fine Canada H-1B work permit applicants. I don't know if anybody's got their applications approved just yet, but this is all geared towards you H-1B visa holders who may have applied through Canada's new H-1B open work permit, that three-year program, which, well, three-year work permit is, is what the program is offering. So I'm not sure how many of you are actually in that situation, um, but there's a lot of you H-1B visa holders who say, well, dang, I didn't even hear about this application process. I didn't subscribe to Mark's course or one of those 150 people that made it through safe and sound through the instructions. Um, what, what options are available? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about why Canada? What are the benefits, pros and cons? What are the possible programs? How does it all work generally? Now, obviously, anyone who wants a strategic plan, all they have to do is click on the link below and book a consult with our firm and I can share insight on that. But at the end of the day, what we're going to talk about here is just give you guys a little bit of overview so that you understand how this works because there's so much misinformation and, um, and it just, it's important to have a foundation so that at least when you're making decisions, you can choose what is best for you. Not every person is the same. And as we saw with you H-1B visa holders, it wasn't just tech. It wasn't just STEM. It was all special, the occupation holders in the U.S. that were eligible. So don't hesitate to let me know. Give me a shout out who's tuning in. I love seeing who's connected with this. But um, we'll get to all the questions and we'll get to all the shout outs after. I want to focus and drill right into the basic foundation of Canadian permanent residence so that you get it, so that you understand. Okay, so the first thing that I want to start off with is something that we call express entry. Now, I know some of you will understand this, but I'm going to treat it as a little bit more basic initially. And then the specific questions will dive in a little bit deeper. We've got about an hour here to work and um, to talk about things and explain. I'm going to spend probably about the first half an hour talking about the options. And then the last part, we will dive into the special, the specific Q&A. So yeah, don't hesitate to click on where you're tuning in from. I love to hear where people are in the US. I also want to know at what stage you're at within your H-1B, the Canada H-1B open work permit journey. So were you in? Did you submit your application? Let me know. And We'll also, I'm happy to talk about what this work permit actually looks like. Those of you who subscribe to the course, we talked about this at length in our group and in the master classes, um, but, uh, but we'll cover that as well so that you understand what you can and can't do and, and how the work permit can actually help you and different types of work permits afford different opportunities for permanent residence. So we're going to talk about that as well. So to start off with what I want to do, and I'm going to use the government website. I want you guys to be able to see and become familiar. I'm not like most lawyers. I'm not like most consultants who have their own internal links. Like if you go to their website, Canada Visa, and it never directs you actually back to the source. They just circle you through their own spiel and their own spin on everything, which is great for keeping people on your site, right? That's a good marketing strategy. But I'm not very good at marketing. All I do is just try to share helpful information. So let's slide over here to the actual page here. This is the government website for the very, very first program. Generally speaking, when people are looking to immigrate to Canada, the first thing they think about is express entry. And this is a program that's designed to get you permanent residence in not 50 years, but less than six months. In fact, if we pull this up right here and we look at IRCC processing times, once again, all I do is show you the source. I don't spin it or do anything. Economic immigration. Then we go to, we'll say for you outside of Canada, Skilled Workers Federal. If you're outside of Canada, processing times right now. And this is like the best it has been in since the pandemic, like since the fall or even the spring of 2020. Seven months. Unbelievable. This is to get your permanent residence from the date you submit it. How many years is it in the U.S.? So that's if you're outside of Canada and have no connection with Canada. If we go to the Canadian Experience class, this is another program, and this is for people who are already working and have at least one year of skilled work experience in Canada, which could very well be you guys. So you can see, this is why it's called Express, for the simple reason that you have processing times that are lightning fast, okay? All right, let's jump back here to Express Entry. So basically, the process, let's get to the right one here. Basically, the process is pretty simple. Canada... Um, provides you an opportunity to submit an expression of interest 
basically what you're saying is, hey, I want to come to Canada. And when you, in the process of doing that, if we go to how Express Entry works, you have to show that you meet one of the eligibilities of, of one of these three programs. So Express Entry in and of itself isn't a program. It's more a way in which they administer the processing of each of these. And just to give you a little bit of feedback. So years ago, like the Federal Skilled Worker Program has always been the granddaddy. It's been around forever. If you're outside of Canada, want to immigrate to Canada, they assess your human capital. And if you meet the criteria, then you could submit an application. And that's all fine and dandy. But the problem, you guys, the problem is that over the years within that program, um, because there was no mechanism to, you know, to, to reduce the number of people applying, guess what you get? you get the H-1B green card process for Indian nationals in the U.S. right now, where it takes 50 years to process an application because they will only do so many each year. Well, Canada was like that, okay? Canada was like that for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. If you had the rights experience, the human capital, which is your education, your language, your work experience, if you had enough points and you were eligible, you could submit an application. But they decided, well, this isn't good because at the time, places like, China, for instance, which was one of the highest source countries, it could have been six or seven years to process an application. We had five or 600,000 applications in the queue. And they said, we got to do something about this. So in 2014, and I was on one of the working groups for the Canadian Bar Association's immigration section, I provided submissions on the initial proposal for express entry, and they proposed to do it faster. So what they did was basically they said, look, if you can meet one of these eligibility for one of these programs, and I won't get into details, this is typically outside of Canada, although people can still qualify for FSW if they're in Canada. Um, the Canadian experience class, if you have at least one year in the previous three years of skilled work experience in Canada, and, and you have a minimum level of language, but we won't worry about that because you guys all speak English just fine, um, then you can get in. And then there's a program for the federal skilled trade, your welders, carpenters. So if you're eligible for one of these programs, you can submit a profile into the pool. Then what Canada does is every well, pretty much every week, every other week, um, let's go here, uh, round of invitations, EEIRCC. Okay, we're going to pull this up. Every every week or, or two weeks, they issue a round of invitations. And you can see this is the last one was two weeks ago. And it was for French language speakers. And, and there are categories. There's a number of different ways that they can extend invitations. So the people that were in the pool, if we go here, you can see as of July 11th, these are the scores, the rankings that everybody's been given. And this is how many people are in that particular uh, range of scores. So you can see how competitive it is. And so they rank you based on the CRS criteria. So let's pull that up and let's take a quick look at the criteria. And this is very high level, guys. And don't worry, we will get to the specific questions. But essentially, to get, just go back to the start, they're going to see, are you eligible for one of these programs? If you're eligible, then you can submit an application into the pool. Once you're in the pool, they will then rank you on these factors, okay? So this comprehensive ranking system, you'll hear lots of people talking about CRS. So they look at your age, your education, language ability, and Canadian work experience. If you're not in Canada, then most of you won't have these. So right off the bat, you're at somewhat of a disadvantage. And without getting into too much issue, if you have a spouse, then points are allocated to your spouse and they're actually taking off you as a principal applicant. So if you're single, then you can get, um, like your points are a little bit higher than if you're married. Because for age, 100 of your points are stripped away. And when you look at level of education, 140, official language, 150, you can see if you're single, You've got, there's 40 more points here, basically, that are all up for grabs. They all go to you as an individual if you're a principal applicant. But if you're married, I think they actually punish you a little bit. Because then your spouse also has to have high education, language, and work experience in order to make up those extra 40 points that are stripped away from you if you're a spouse, if you're married, or in a common law relationship. And uh, so individuals really have a little bit of an advantage in this process. But make a long story short, I'm not going to go through all of the different factors, but they, they, they look at those core factors as well as some other factors. And the other factors are additional points that really make or break the difference. Like they, they make the difference, hands down. And if you think of yourself as an H-1B visa holder in the U.S. who looks to come to Canada on that work permit... I'll show you one other thing here. You'll see that there are up to 70 extra points 
if you're married and 80 extra points if you have um, if you're without a, a spouse um, that, that are just for Canadian work experience. So how do you get those extra points to make a difference? Well, you get them by working in Canada. Let me take another step back to the rounds of invitations. So you'll see that the scores right here, if we go back and we look at the previous rounds of invitations, we'll just look at just the core, no program specified. So this basically means it's entirely based on human capital. So 800 invitations back on July 11th, 505 was the lowest comprehensive ranking system score. So I want to show you something here. I wish I could show you my course in my Express Entry course. I've got this broken down a little bit easier. But essentially, to give you an idea of what these scores mean, if you are, and I'll just I'll just go back here so you can see me a little better. Okay, if you are 29 years old, not older, if you turn 30, you lose five points. If you're 29 years old, you have three years of skilled work experience. You have a Canadian language benchmark of nine, which basically is eight in listening and seven in the other abilities on the IELTS. Um, and you have, um, let's see, uh, a master's degree, okay? Or at least two or more degrees. So one bachelor's plus another certificate of at least one year. So that threshold but let's just keep it simple. If you're 29 years old, master's degree, three years of skilled work experience, and you have a CLB9, guess how many points you have? 469. Let's take a look. So 469 points. You can see when was the last time that they did a round of invitations of 469. Okay, so these ones don't count because these are program specified. So they're already limiting them. But 469, if we go back here to all of these previous ones before the world of, of in June where they started doing more targeted occupation specific, before that, if you scroll through here, 469, 469. Do you see this? Do you see how far back I'm going here? 469, 469. I'm not seeing anything. All the way back to July, I guess it would be, 60, it might even be September the 14th of 2021. So what I'm getting at is if you're outside of Canada as an H-1B visa holder and you're applying and you want to come through express entry, you are not going to get through, even if you meet the, the eligibility for the Federal Skilled Worker Program, you're never going to get drawn without this Canadian work experience or one of these other factors. And if you look here, if we go down to the other factors, do you have a sibling in Canada? Well, that might give you an extra 15 points. Do you speak French? This is a massive one right now, okay? Did you, and then did you study in Canada? Um, do you have a job offer from a Canadian employer uh, or a nomination from one of the provinces, which we will get to as well? So essentially, in order to get um, one of those elusive um, rounds of invitations, you need to have something more than just your awesome human capital. So. Where does, that, where does that lead people to? What it leads them to is their open work permit. So if you come, you work in Canada, and there's right here, um, if all you have to do, if you, you don't have to go to someone's website and see, do I qualify? Ignore that. Just Google Comprehensive Ranking System, CRS tool, and then use the one that's the Government of Canada, which is this one. And when you enter in your information, it's super easy to figure out how many points you get. Um, because it will give you your score. It will calculate it for you based on the answers. Now, you need to write a formal language test. You need to have your educational credentials assessed through one of the designated ECA educational credential assessment agencies. But you can kind of guess and you can figure out what your score is here. And by doing that, it will figure, it'll give you an idea of how close you are to one of these areas. Now, with that being said, I want to jump back here and say, as of June, Canada started doing something different and this is all of you STEM people that are H-1Bers that applied for your open work permit. Guys, you could very well be possible, like could be eligible to get one of the rounds of invitations. If we go right here, uh, let's see, express entry. Oh yeah, you could very well receive one of these invitations to apply and score high enough because they've shifted the way they do this a little bit now and have created category-based invitations. And if you just Google this, express entry, uh, category-based Let's see, draws, uh, let's see what comes up here. I 
think we should right here. Alicia did this one. You can just Google it. And this will talk about the occupations that fit in one of these targeted draws. And the reason the targeted draws are so important is because if we go back here to our ranking system, I've got too many pages open here. If we go back to the ranking system, you'll see that in the previous rounds of invitation, if you're just applying on human capital alone, these programs specified, no program specified, the CRS scores right here are really high, okay? 500s. But one of the occupation categories is STEM. And so you can see they did a small one of 500 and the score was 486, which is still really high. But we expect that they're going to do a lot more of these STEM ones, which potentially could give you an opp opportunity to apply for permanent residence before you even start using your open work permit. So seriously consider this. I've got a course, a masterclass I'm running right now. Go check that out. There's links, I think, in, in the description below. But learn what you can about this. On our firm website, you can go to Express Entry, and there's a ton of information here that explains how it works, okay? So I'd encourage you to slide over there and check that out. But back to this whole discussion of, um, of rounds of invitations. So you can see when they do multiple category-based draws, the CRS score starts to drop. And for those of you who fit under the STEM category, so they, these are the areas, these are the areas, and STEM is on it. These are essentially occupations in demand. If you go down here, and we've got all of these listed on our site, if your occupation fits on here, and you have six months of skilled work experience in these knocks, that's paid and meets all the other traditional requirements in one of these areas, um, then you could very well, six months within the past three years is all you need, um, then you could very well be considered for one of the targeted draws under STEM. So consider that. But some of you may also be, have expertise on H1B in other areas. You know, we have healthcare, right? You could, maybe you're a healthcare professional. Uh, maybe you are a, a GP or a family physician. You know, I don't know what they do for H1Bs in the US, how broad it is, but but clearly there are a number of occupations within healthcare, within STEM. Um, they even have other ones. Trade, probably most of you H1Bers aren't trade or transport um, or ag, but ultimately, especially healthcare and STEM, be very, very aware of, um, of the options. So right summarizing all of this again, express entry, this process here, if you meet the eligibility for one of the programs, then you might be eligible for express entry right away if potentially you're drawn under one of the um, category, you know, based draws. That's a possibility, okay? But if you can't, if your human capital and your scores are not high enough to get drawn under one of these rounds of invitations, then you have to look on how you can increase your scores with these things that we talked about here such as arranged employment. And an arranged employment isn't just a, a Canadian employer offering you a job. Arranged employment is one of three categories. One, well, the first two are based on labor market impact assessments, which are kind of like your H-1B. And then the third is similar to an L visa, an intercompany transfer, or one of the agreements that Canada has with other countries, treaties. If you're on an employer-specific work permit and you've worked for a year for that employer in Canada on an employer-specific work permit, then you can get these extra bonus points, 50 points. If you're senior management, then up to 200 extra points, which really guarantees you're going to get an invitation to apply for permanent residence. So back to the kind of wrap this up. So express entry is one of the main ways and you really, it's important that you understand how this works because it drives the ship for everything else. So one of these programs, Canadian Experience Class, working in Canada for a year, Federal Skilled Worker Program or Federal Skilled Trade, if you meet the eligibility and your score high enough here on the comprehensive ranking system right here, then you will receive an invitation right here to apply. That invitation means you will then submit a permanent resident application. And when you submit it, then we get down to the crazy, uh, let's see if we have it here, uh, I think I dropped it away. The processing times of four or seven months, okay? So that's basically how it works, okay? And once you get your ITA extended to you, you're going to collect your documents, you're going to submit your application, and um, and then, yeah, within four months if you're in Canada, seven months if you're outside Canada, you could be a permanent resident. But if you aren't ranking high enough, if you don't have a high enough score, 
um, to, to rank here, then you have to do things to try to increase the chances of success, okay? And one of the ways in which we do that is by coming to Canada, working, and getting a job. So if you looked up at the top here, our main headings for, for experience, you can get a whack of bonus points um, when you work in Canada. And for most people, one year, at least for you H-1Bers, will be enough. For most of you, one year will be enough. So if we go down here to the actual work experience, you'll see that if you're married, you can get 35 extra points for one year. And if you're without a spouse, 40. Now I wanna point out as well, that age can be a real kicker for you older H-1Bs because the, the sweet spot is 20 to 29 years of age. Once you turn 30, you start to lose five points, at least in some cases, six points. It depends on which side of the column you're on for each year that you have a birthday. So the older you are, the more points you're losing. And so what that means is even if you do uh, get fortunate enough to get a job offer and secure Let's say if we scroll down to the bottom here, you, you secure one of those extra arranged employment 50 points. Well, you may already be 50 points behind because you're older. So work experience in Canada opens up doors and more points through the, this express entry process, this lightning fast way of getting permanent residence. And so for you H-1Bers, that's why it's so important if you're not ranking high enough as it is to be able to come to Canada and work. But not all provinces are equal. So this takes us to the next level. So when you're applying for express entry and you're going through this process, you'll see when we go, when we go to the comprehensive ranking system that if someone can secure a provincial nomination right here, they get 600 points, which basically guarantees that you're going to get an invitation to apply and get your permanent residence. But each province has its own gig. So if we look at the provincial nominee programs, um, Every province has its own system for applying. Each of them have their own have their own expectations, their own requirements for the program. And so there's a bunch of information that you can read, but each province, if you go to every provincial website, you'll be able to see what they have. So if I go to Alberta, for instance, Alberta has um, not only a, um, uh, a stream um, that is independent from the federal government. So you can go through Alberta's opportunity stream. So if I go to the application streams here, um, you'll see that they have a number of different pathways. Each province does, whether it's Alberta, Ontario, or wherever. But the Alberta opportunity stream, the beauty of this one, if you come to Alberta, and every province is different, is that they don't care about your age. If you're in Alberta and you're working on an employer-specific work permit, which is not your H-1B, you're pretty much guaranteed to go through the Alberta Opportunity Stream. But within this program itself, understand that there are also programs um, or sections or subsections within this that cater to STEM. So a lot of you are probably wondering, okay, well, if I come and I work in uh, a province, how do I know which province is going to be the best for me? How do I know which province is going to open up the most doors for me? And, and that's a really, really good question. So each province has their own requirements. Like I said, each one has some that are based on job offers. In other words, employer-specific work permits where they're supported by labor market impact assessments. That's not you as an h one b -er. Some provinces have, they don't care. As long as you have experience in the province, even if it's on an open work permit, they will consider you. So like I said, you have to do your research. And I'm, I can't cover all of this in one, uh, one particular um, session. But... Here's something I want to point out. Let's look at the two main places that you would probably consider. British Columbia and Ontario. So if we look at Ontario here, you'll see that Ontario has a category called the Human Capital Priority Stream. And you can see they the notica notifications of interest, they issue a ton. They have a lot of space. But already in 2023... Um, you can see for human capital priority stream, it, it serves a, the largest portion of the, of the invitations um, extended and the nominations extended. And if you go down here, you'll be able to see that they do targeted draws. So on July the 20th, just five days ago, if you met the requirements for what they're looking for within these tech draw right here, you can see they look at the scores that you have within your express entry profile, even though this is the federal, um, even the express entry is federal, 
this is a partnership that the provinces have with them where the the provinces say, the provinces basically say hey these people we really want to support but IRCC we want you to fast track their applications through express entry so that's what this human capital priority stream is and i'm not going to go into all the details for every province but this is just an example many provinces have tech specific categories that put you in a separate section or give you um, uh, advantages that others don't. And so you can see in Ontario, do you see what we have here? Look at the range that they give. If your CRS score fell within this narrow range, my goodness, 902 notifications of interest were issued, but it was for people that fell between 458 and 462. Why the heck did they pick this particular slot within within the, um, let's just see here, within the comprehensive ranking system. So if you go here, you can see the stem for the federal government right here with express entry was 486. So generally Ontario tends to pick a range that's below where people normally would get invitations through express entry, okay? And they have them for health draws. And they did another tech here and they did it from 479 to 485 on July the 6th. So you can see here that it, there's a little bit of guesswork and crap shooting, I guess, is the best way to describe it. So within each of these provinces, they all have some programs that are, that are processed through express entry, fast-tracked, and then others that are slower. And if we go back to the IRCC processing times, and I'll just pull up the, the generic provincial nominee programs, if we go here to economic immigration and then we selected provincial nominees and then we say, is it a part of express entry? No. And we get processing times. You can see that it's much more lengthy. So sometimes the programs like, for example, Alberta's opportunity stream, it's not associated with express entry, this particular one. So it means that this program doesn't have you competing against other people. If you meet the eligibility requirements, which are not terribly onerous, as long as you are working on an employer-specific work permit in Alberta, and once again, the H-1B is not employer-specific, so you have to take that in consideration when you come, um, then um, it's, it's a fast-track route, uh, basically, uh, to, to getting the nomination, and then the processing in the second part with the federal government takes a little bit longer, as we can see here. It's a two-part process. Okay, I can see that I've spent a lot of time <laughs> talking about a lot of things, but I want you to understand how express entry works and um, that for many of you, this will be the pathway to permanent residence for you. If you don't rank high enough, then you're going to consider if you're, you know, one of the various provinces that potentially you want, you, you will be working in, okay? Some provinces have um, more favorable pathways than others. And when you look at, uh, when I am advising people that don't have a direct connection, or for example, someone who's saying, well, where should I study? Which province should I go to? Back to my original discussion here, I flip back, not all provinces are created equal. Most people go to BC, most people go to Ontario. And if you have an amazing job with a tech company that says, we're gonna support you with an LMIA, and we're gonna lock you in, and we love what you're doing, and you come work for us on your open work permit and we'll support you to get your permanent residence, then great. BC and Ontario could be a great spot for you. But understand, 49% of all international students go to Ontario, okay? And not far behind is British Columbia. All of those people will be vying for the limited provincial nominee spots or if they can rank high enough through the comprehensive ranking system here and all the points, and they can get an ITA on their human capital alone, this no program specified draw. Well, then great. You know what? Then, then it may be just fine to consider going to one of, uh, you know, British Columbia or, or, or Ontario. But what I always advise my clients is you want to go to the locations where you're going to have the, multi, have the most opportunities and multiple pathways to permanent residence because you just don't know. And right now, the Atlantic provinces like New Brunswick, like Newfoundland and Labrador, like Nova Scotia, like Prince Edward Island, the Atlantic Immigration Program is a separate standalone program if you're working with an employer in one of those provinces. Even if you're on an open work permit, there is pathways to permanent residence that once again don't require you to have to compete with others through this comprehensive ranking system. 
And so I personally, although every person is different, would strongly encourage you to look in the centers, even Saskatchewan, right? Even Manitoba, even Alberta, before you consider defaulting to BC and Ontario, because there will be multiple pathways. Multiple pathways like, like express entry, okay? Then there is the provincial nominee programs, and there are other programs, which I haven't talked about, which that are economic in nature, like there are rural, rural renewal stream programs. And then in other provinces, there, like the Atlantic provinces, there's the Atlantic immigration program. So what's the most important factor? It tends to be work experience. And if you're already highly experienced, you've got great education. Many provinces have special tech draws that are focused specifically to tech or other occupations like healthcare. They're in demand federally and they're in demand provincially, but that is how it's structured. So when you're coming to Canada on your work permit, yes, you have to find your job and there's no guarantees. You have to hustle. Nothing is being handed out to you. The one difference you have is that you've got a freaking three-year open work permit to work for whoever the heck you want. Now, as long as it's skilled, you can even get by bouncing from one employer to another. Let's say you get a job offer for a Canadian tech company in Toronto. And, you know, they say, oh, we're so amazing. We're going to do all these things for you. You get there and it freaking sucks, which happens. You are not an indentured servant sometimes like you are on an H-1B. You say, well, screw you. I'm going to take this job with this other company that's going to pay me $20,000 more and doesn't require me to be on call all weekend and basically have no life. Sound familiar? So the open work permit allows you to do that. Now, when it comes to competitiveness, you do get bonus points for having an employer-specific work permit. But Canada has a number of pathways to that even. And yes, you can transition from an open work permit to an LMIA-based work permit. And what is the LMIA? Well, basically the employer shows, and this is where an LMIA is even better than an H-1B. There are no LMIA-based work permits in Canada. They just have to show that there's no one that can do your job in Canada, that they've advertised and that no one is available um, or has the qualifications to fill your job. And if that's the case, then there's no arbitrary cap on the number issued. You just get the LMIA. So it's actually, there's really, really high chances that employers are able to do that because these are all occupations that are in demand across Canada, especially STEM. So open work permit can be transitioned um, to an employer-specific work permit, which will give you bonus points for PR. But in many cases, even the work experience you gain on an open work permit will be enough to give you that, that extra bonus points for express entry or connections where a province says, hey, we love you. We want to nominate you, right? So those things are all possible. And but remember, it is, yes, you're on an open work permit. You can come, you can get that job, but nothing is handed out. You have to work your tail off. You have to distinguish yourself from other people. There's no guarantee. If you're a crappy employee and you're not some, someone that a company wants to hire and you're not very good at marketing yourself, well, it's no different where you live, whether you're in India, the US or Canada, you have to convince an employer that, hey, I'm going to add value to your business. But the difference is they don't have to apply for an LMIA to hire you. They don't have to really do anything other than offer you the job and you can start tomorrow. That's the golden aspect of this open work permit. It's beautiful. And of course, your spouse can get an open work permit. Your kids can get those study permits. And if you're having any trouble with that kind of stuff, the government hasn't released, for those of you who submitted on your own without your family, um, they haven't released specific instructions on how to do that. But definitely, I'll be keeping you guys informed. All right. So that's a very high level of the permanent resident applications. Um, like I said, in, in I have my DIY course on express entry. Actually, I've got my masterclass starting in about 24 minutes, uh, day two of our masterclass. And you can go in there and you can subscribe at any time. I've talked a lot about it already um, within the context of the H-1B course, which was a just a phenomenal success. But if you just slide over to our, our actually Canadian Immigration Institute site, you'll see that all the courses are here. And Express Entry, we're doing this right now, but it doesn't matter. Because when you subscribe to the course, you have access to all 10 hours of on-demand, specific um, uh, instructions, step-by-step -step on how to complete your own application. 
So all the modules and everything are all listed here, breaking down each of the sections and each of the categories. Um, but you also have access to all or any and all future master classes. So you can attend now, you can catch a couple now, and then join me in the next series that I do. So there's lots of opportunity to do that. Okay, I think I've talked enough and I know lots of people have questions and I know some of you are gonna ask about H1B stuff. Let's jump in and let's let's get to the to the Q and A portion here, and uh, well, like I said, we'll try to hit some of the high level. I know I'm not going to get to all of them, and uh, uh, but we'll we'll just do our best to to because I know that what a couple of people ask questions, others will ask the same. Okay, uh, bad news says, is there an age factor when you apply for a PR from a work permit? Okay, we talked about that. When you're going through Express Entry, they do factor age, but if you can get a provincial nomination. Uh, to support your express entry application through one of the PNP express entry streams, then you're going to get an extra 600 points. So age won't be a difference. Uh, but if you're just going through the straight, no program specified human capital, then yeah, once you hit 30, you start losing points. For many of the provinces, they don't care. Now, in some provinces, when they have, um, uh, you know, uh, they have their own little competitive rankings within them, then sometimes age plays a role, but it doesn't always. Okay, uh, Ka says, if you worked remotely for a Canadian employer in the U.S., does this still count as Canadian work experience? No, it doesn't. You need to be in Canada. Okay, uh, AP says, um, is a work permit, if it gets approved, is there any specific time period we need to show up in Canada? There will be an expiry on the actual approval letter. So you're going to need to make sure that you, um, uh, that you travel to Canada and secure your work permit before it expires, before your visa expires or the time period that IRCC gives you. Once you've got it, if you want to return back to the U.S., I'm not giving you advice on leaving the U.S. or re-entering. I'm not an immigration attorney, but if you are legally authorized to leave and re-enter, your visa is valid. Um, getting the Canadian work permit from a Canadian perspective means you can come and work in Canada whenever you want, as long as you you know your visa is still valid. Okay, Viraj is in Florida. Good to see you. Transients in Berkeley, California. Thanks. TechGuru says directly issues PR for H-1B holder. No, there is no direct just because you have an H-1B um, visa or the Canada H-1B work permit. There's no automatic guarantee you're going to get permanent residence. Anyone who's saying that is lying to you. But you guys, if you're already in the U.S. as an H-1B, it means you've got good education, good work experience, good language abilities, all the things that with just a little bit of experience in Canada can open so many doors to you. Okay. Um, let's see here. We're going to try to keep these. Any update on having H1B visa stamping versus just having I-797? No update, Shahid. <clears throat> okay. Jari says, hey, Mark, for statutory questions, is an ESTA refusal considered like a visa refusal? I always treat any of those things like refusals and I disclose them. I don't take any chances. Okay, uh, Cyro says, hey, love your videos. Can I continue to work with H&B in the U.S. after getting my PR? What are the rules for Canada immigration in this case? Okay, Cyro, if you get your permanent residence, then the rules for Canada is that you must live in Canada for at least two years in every five-year period. So that means you could do it pieces, you know, two months here, three months there. But cumulatively, over the five-year period immediately preceding the date in which you submit your PR card extension application, um, you need to show that you've had two years in Canada. If not, then you can lose your per permanent residence. And it's physical presence. Okay, Amarjeet says, Henrik, if someone is working in Canada for one year and of age 40, are there any chances for the individual in the express entry? Well, it's possible. If you look at the points, so if you take five points are subtracted every year, right? Every year that you um, turn 30, and have a birthday. Let's take a let's take a look at the actual comprehensive ranking system. Let's take a look at it together here, and I'll show you. Okay, so if we scroll down here, let's look at age. Oh, wrong one. This one. Okay, so if we go back up here and we look at age, there we go. Okay, so you can see here, 110 points if you're single. That's the maximum points that you can get. But the difference between being 29. And 40 right here, you can see, is, is 60 points. So it's a whack of points that, um, you know, that you're going to miss if you, um, uh, with, with age. And 
And if it's 60 points, you'll remember if you have one year of work experience in Canada as a, as a, we'll just scroll down here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, here. So if you look at work experience, if you have one year, you're only reclaiming if you're married 35. And if you've got a spouse, you're only reclaiming 40. So for the core human capital under express entry, you then would need to look at other things. Okay, then my what if my company says, hey, we'll extend an official arranged employment to you, which is we'll transition your work permit to an open work permit. If you're an executive, right, you could get up to 200. If you are um, just working in a regular skilled occupation, it could be an extra 50. So together then you're getting 50 plus 40 if you're single 90 or 85 points which means that after a year, even if you are older, your CRS is still going to increase if, with that job offer. So it's, you know, so, so it's possible. In short, Emergeet, it's possible. Okay. All right. Um, Patrick says, how about 45 plus people? It seems there is not many options. That's not the case, Patrick, at all. Okay, let's go. Let's take a specific example, okay? <clears throat> um, okay, let's go to the Atlantic Immigration Program. Let's say you choose to go to, um, each province has their own gig. Okay, let's, I'll just, I'll just highlight this, okay? So the Atlantic Immigration Program covers all of the, the maritime provinces, okay? So New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland. If you are in Canada, Patrick, and you have an employer in one of these provinces, as an example, um, that's designated, and it's not impossible to get it. It's pretty easy to get designated. Okay. And you are working for that, you know, um, for that uh, employer in the province already because you're on an open work permit and you've started to work for them and they love you. Age does not factor into this, to this process, not in the way it does for the comprehensive ranking system, right? Where you're going to actually with the CRS, you're, you're actually going to lose points because of, because of age. So understand that only anything through express entry is going to be impacted by age. Um, and this is why it's such a, you know, if because you guys, when you come, like you're awesome. You've got phenomenal work experience. You know, you are going to bring so much just ability to, you know, knowledge, technical ability, I should say, to these employers. You know, they're going to be just, if I was an employer and I was in the tech business and I had someone who came from the U.S. who had 10 years of experience on an H-1B in the U.S., and they were going to come over and work, you know, do software and development for me. And we're willing to take a little bit of a pay cut because yes, Canada taxes are higher and income's a little bit lower. My goodness, I would do everything I could to support them, including applying for a labor market impact assessment. So, um, and when it comes to the provinces, like many of them, uh, age is not an issue, not nearly as much. <laughs> okay, here he is. I wonder how long he's going to be here. Did they reshuffle the cabinet? Let's see. Uh... I didn't see if they, they reshuffled the, the cabinet. Um, let's see. Uh, it just says, at least CTV here, just says, um, oh, okay, here we go. So this is where you guys need to pay attention here. Right, minister? Are you still going to be the minister? I don't know. But anyways, I better not show too much because the newspapers always give me trouble, even though I do nice reports for them. But they're talking about, looks like Wednesday maybe, uh, Wednesday is when the shuffle is tomorrow. So we'll see how that plays out. So we'll see if Minister Fraser is still the minister. So maybe that's why he didn't come to join me. Who knows? We'll see. All right. <laughs> okay, Minister, we'll see you for now. Okay, let's keep zipping through here. Um, okay, so he, Shahid's got mistakenly said no to biometrics and didn't get the biometric documents. Will I still be prompt to submit it as a part of processing? Possibly, possibly. Okay, um, Kay says, hey, Mark, was looking to get consultation. Do you review documents on consultation? I don't spend a lot of time reviewing documents in a consultation. I learned my lesson doing that probably about five years ago. I had someone who brought documents just for me to review, but then the application got rejected because the information that the, per push, that, that the person put into the forms was not consistent with the documents. So all the documents on their, on their surface were fine. The information they put into their portal wasn't correct. And so they, um, they, they claimed that I mismanaged their, their file and didn't give them good advice because I should have known that. So I no longer do document-only review. 
I will only do um, very, very comprehensive reviews, Kay, where I go through everything, like from start to finish. But understand, that is why I created the Express Entry step-by-step -step course, Kay. For Express Entry, this is why I created this sucker, um, was because, you know, if people felt like they wanted to just really truly do it on their own and they didn't need feel like they needed the peace of mind of retaining our firm, uh, that's that's how I uh, pros approach the the process. But at, you know things like have I chosen the right knock code? Absolutely, I'll review that in a consult. So that those are things that we do. I just won't review all of your documents in a consult. Okay, and then I know there's a bunch of other people that are saying that they made mistakes um, in their uh, in their work permit application. You can submit, watch the previous videos that I did on this topic on my YouTube channel. And all you have to do, you guys, is just go to the main site. Let me just flip it over. And I'm going to direct people back so I don't have to keep saying the same types of things. If you go to the Candidates for NB Visa Holder stream, the playlist on my channel, you'll see here that I have a bunch of uh, different topics. Um, so this one in particular, this one is all about the uh, challenges, essentially. Problems, common mistakes, practical tips when you filed your application. So go watch this one here. And I've got examples of submitting web forms and how you deal with it. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll leave that at that. And let's keep zipping down through some other questions here. So that's questions like yours, um, Shaw, here. Okay. Uh, Shoab says, I came to know from the IRCC website that with Canada H1 work permit, the employer has to be from Canada only. Is it true? Well, of course. It's a Canadian work permit. If the employer isn't in Canada, then why would you need a Canada work permit? So I think I'm understanding your question. So yeah, the employer needs to be in Canada. So if you travel to Canada and you're in Canada and you work for a U.S. company, there's very little advantage to that when it comes to applying for permanent residence. Um, it's only when you're working for a Canadian company that you get those extra points. There's nothing stopping you from living in Canada and having an open work permit and working for a U.S. company. There isn't. Make sure you, you know, seek tax advice. You may need to file, um, uh, file you know, basically a um, file your taxes in, the, in Canada. You know, I should probably have a tax advisor come on. I should. I have to make a note of that. Okay. Um, okay. Transient says, hey, will they only start processing H-1Bs after biometrics are submitted or will they process it before we submit biometrics? They will work on it uh, in, in between. Like they will work on it in between. I have no doubt that they do. Um, like there's a lot of people that have biometrics already completed and, um, and when they go through the process, <laughs> yes, Mark, got it. <laughs> um, yeah, the, I suspect that they're working and getting things prepped up, just waiting for the biometrics. But it's also possible that, you know, as they're, you know, some officers, um, you know, may, may wait for biometrics because they're working on ones that don't need it, the ones that have already had it, I guess. Okay. Um, great question, Valpula says, can I stay in Canada with an open work permit and not have a job for, say, one year? Well, Valpula, you could come to Canada on your open work permit and stay for up to three years and not have a job. You just have to be able to support yourself, right? So that's the beauty of Canada, right? Okay, Tech Guru says, 20 years experience and have US I uh, I-140 immigrant application pending PR. Okay, great. Um, okay, I've already answered. Uh, good to see you, Jude. Hey, Jude. Don't you like that? I could sing the Beatles. Hey, Jude, don't feel sad. Yeah. Do you know what my favorite show is? Just randomly, Yesterday. Have you guys watched that show yesterday? I love that show. Every time I think of you, Jude. Jude is a happy permanent resident of Canada. So proud of you, my friend. The U.S. did not want Jude, but Jude came to Canada because Canada wanted him. And we made it happen, didn't we, my friend? Yes, we did. Okay. Um... Let's keep zipping through here. Prashant says, can I apply for a study permit for a child after the work permit is approved? Yeah, you can, Prashant. The exact details in terms of efficiency, we don't know yet. Okay, Srinivas says, I've included my family name in my given name while applying for H-1B. In my full name, my family name is repeated twice. How can I fix that? Oh, 
Well, you can always go back and advise, send a web form if you want to correct it within your application. Um, send an IRCC web form and just notify them of the error. Okay. Um, okay, I think we talked about this viral. After approval, how much time will I get to be there? Well, up to three years if the work permit is issued for three years. But <coughs> what I want you guys to understand is that everything doesn't just come to an end. Like usually within three years, you're going to have some pathways to permanent residence or there's going to be some mechanisms in place with your current employer to extend that work permit through, say, the foreign worker program, which is um, the LMIA process, the labor market impact assessment process. So that's a possibility. Um, you may have a permanent resident application in the queue and you can apply for a bridging open work permit. You may come from a country where Canada has a treaty. You can transition from your open work permit to one of those other work permits. So viral, there are options. There are options. Okay, Navneeth, let's see. Currently on an open work permit, received ITA for express entry. Can I leave Canada return after submitting a PR application? If your work permit and your, and your visitor visa and your passport are valid, um, then you may be able to leave and re-enter. Understand every time you leave, an officer on re-entry can assess your admissibility. So if you go away, get a DUI in the U.S., seek to come back, you could be found inadmissible to Canada. Yep, Viraj says in U.S., sometimes employers give only employment verification and not experience letter. With this work for express entry, I had eight employers in 10 years and not everyone might give a letter. Raj, I recommend you book a consult and we can go through that. Remember, if we're looking at the comprehensive ranking system, and I'll show you guys one other thing within the actual, um, uh, within the CRS. One, one last little tip, tip here as we're just about ready to wrap up. When it comes to foreign work experience, you'll see here that for points, oh, not this one, this one here. When you're assessing the comprehensive ranking system right here, the core human capital factors are based on Canadian work experience, not foreign. But there's a section here where you get bonus points called the skill transferability factors. And in here, if you have foreign work experience and really good, um, a really good Canadian language, then you can get up to 50 points. But the way, if we go into the specifics here, I'll just show you here. Let me just go down, spouse, blah, blah, right here and here. You will see that once you hit three years of foreign work experience for the comprehensive ranking system, you're not getting any more points. The maximum points you can get is 50 points. And so as long as you've met the eligibility for the federal skilled worker program, that's 67 points if you're outside of Canada, well, then then, then that's sufficient. Three years is often um, when, when you're going to max out. So in terms of counting the points from all the employers, we always go through and see what you need and what you don't need because you may very well only need three years. And so if you can't get reference letters from every employer, well, screw them. You can, you can potentially not list them in the work history, but instead list them in the personal history to give a full background of what you've done, but only the employers that you want to claim po points for you have to, to, to list. And I cover that barrage in my course, in the Express Entry course as well. Okay, Sunny said, when LMI is still add value when you're on an open work permit? Heck yeah, for all the reasons that I talked about. For express entry, you're getting another 50 points or even up to 200 points for that job offer. Many provinces will give you bonus value if you're on an LMIA-based work permit in those provinces um, because you've basically the employer has basically proven that there's no Albertan or Saskatchewan resident or Ontario resident that, um, that has the skills to fill the job because otherwise the LMIA would never have been issued. Okay. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, where was I? Um, I was fishing on the weekend. I had a lot of fun drifting down the river fishing. And uh, uh, many of you probably will remember that I caught uh, a nice little rainbow trout. Um, let's see. I was here. Let's see if this will, I don't know if this will show. Probably not. I'm going to take a picture of it. I wish I could show you the video. Eh, maybe I can. Why not? I'm going to show you the video here. We've got just two minutes. I can do anything here. This is this is crazy stuff. So let's see if I can share this. I'm not sure if it'll work. Never tried to do this. Oh, it doesn't show. Okay, I guess I can't do that. I thought I was going to be able to share my, um, uh, my photos here, but it looks like I am unable to do that unless I pulled it over. 
Let's see. This is, this is, oh yeah, I can probably show you this here. Okay, let's see if this fits. It may not fit on my screen. Oh, you piece of junk. Why are you not sharing? Let's go. I have an idea. I'm going to go back to here. This is my big screen. Now I'm going to share it with you guys. Uh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to drag it right onto my screen. Just got to be creative. There. Look at that. That's a beautiful little stream right flowing into this awesome river where I was fishing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Fun times. That's what I was doing. <laughs> That's where I've been. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Patrick says the working experience has to be STEM related to the STEM as what we did before. In some cases, if the, there's a targeted draw, um, you know, then the experience that you have needs to be within STEM. But when you come to Canada under express entry, your work experience just needs to be skilled. It can be in other jobs. Joseph says, which province do you recommend for people over 40, uh, for PR? Well, for the most part, not Ontario or British Columbia. Simple as that. That's a starting point. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Okay, Sunny says, what's the best time to renew a passport? As my passport is valid for only one and a half years and spouse passport is one year more. Can we renew passport after biometrics? Do it ASAP, as soon as you possibly can. That's my recommendation. Okay, uh, Sunny says, does the job offer need to be LMIA approved for the points even on an open work permit? So the points come in different forms. There's points for express entry, the federal program. There's points for each individual provincial nominee program. And so um, when it comes to express entry, open work permits will never give you extra points for offers of employment, for job offers. But you will get those points for Canadian work experience. And that's, that's where the points come from. <laughs> Igor says, nice to see you in the chat, Jude. That's great. Um, let's see if there's anything else here. Um, Cynthia says, LMIA approval, does it work with points or not? Well, for express entry, if you have an, L an approved LMIA, that is considered to be an arranged offer of employment. Now, I don't know if that LMIA is just for permanent residents or whether it's a dual purpose for, uh, for a work permit and to support permanent residents. Um, or in some cases, LMIAs are just, just for the work permit. So, but yes, those extra points are, are directly linked to LMIAs. And that goes the same for, for all provinces and different programs. They all highly value people working in Canada on LMIA work permits. But any open work permit will open the door for you to build a relationship with an employer. And this is something that people don't understand. Like, how do you find a great job in Canada? Well, if you're applying from outside of Canada, cold, you're very rarely going to get a job, right? Unless you're, it's like you're a high-end C-suite executive who's being headhunted, right? And some of you, you know, software developers might be headhunted directly by the employer who is then willing to go through the LMIA process to bring you in. But for you guys, you will have open work permits that will allow you to come to Canada and work for anyone virtually subject to the medical, the occupations that are restricted by medicals, um, you know, which are not traditionally, you know, the you know, tech positions, right? Um, they're more healthcare um, and working with small children, et cetera. But yeah, you have a chance to then prove yourself to an employer. And then, you know, if they really like what they see, then they have the ability to, to, to support you as you go forward. But under express entry, after, you know, you've got the work experience in Canada, you often don't even need the employer support. All right. All right. We have reached the end, you guys. So we'll definitely come back and we will have uh, Imagine says, think I have become addicted to this channel. Love these live sessions. I'd even watch the ones not directly relevant to my case. All right, my friend, I'm going to give you one of these. A little bit of an applause. All right, I better get over to my master class. You guys, all you have to do is just go to the link, click on it below and slide over and join me in the master class where I dive in deep into all things Express Entry. Uh, but I've got the students waiting for me, so I had better slide over there. All right. Thanks for joining me. Hope this was helpful. Take care, everyone, and we will see you soon. Vilpala.